Hello and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle, and I am pleased to be in front of the carbon steel microphone uh, bringing the show to you. And of course, the boy wonder is across the table from me. He's behind his monitors. He's making everything uh, work right behind the scenes, and that is Jared. Good morning, Jared. How you doing? Good morning. I'm doing fantastic. It's a nice day here in Biloxi. It's a fantastic day here on the Gulf Coast. And uh, we want to let you guys know that uh, we've got a lot of good stuff coming up with Student of the Gun. Now, Student of the Gun, we're kind of a media octopus. We, we do we have lots of different tentacles. We have Student of the Gun Radio, which you're listening to right now, and we thank you for doing that. We have our Student of the Gun website, studentofthegun.com. And uh, via that, you can watch the show, you can watch videos, you can read the articles. We've got Student of the Gun, A Beginner Once, A Student for Life, the book, which you can get on Amazon, or you can get a signed copy directly from us. So we've kind of got lots of tentacles going out there, but... Uh, Doing a quick follow-up from last week. Now, we were out at the Red Jacket Birthday Bash at Will Hayden's Birthday Bash last week in Ruston, Louisiana. And if you listened to the previous episode, you know that. Well, what we did is we recorded it, and this coming episode, the next episode of Student of the Gun TV, is going to have the footage. So you want to make sure that you mark your calendars and tune in. It's going to be up uh, on, two Jared, is it going to be Tuesday the 10th or the 11th? Uh, I believe it's going to be Tuesday the 11th. Okay, so make sure that you're checking out studentofthegun.com on Tuesday, June 11th, or if you're listening to this after then, you can just go to Student of the Gun and you can watch the footage. You can see what we did at the uh, Red Jacket Firearms Birthday Bash. Now, we've got a lot of stuff coming up, and if you guys haven't been paying attention to Student of the Gun, A, you need to start doing so. But one of the things that we do uh, all year long is we do uh, – special giveaways or partnerships with our sponsors. And we've got a lot of fantastic sponsors. And one of our sponsors is Keltec Weapons of Cocoa, Florida. And we talked to them. I just talked to them last week. I talked to my friends down there in Keltec at Keltec. And we're getting ready to launch the fourth season of Student of the Gun TV. Now, Keltec sponsors Student of the Gun Radio, and they also are a sponsor of Student of the Gun TV. They've been with us for several seasons now. And we are going to do a special giveaway. Now, I can't give you all the details right now because we haven't done the official press release, but let me tell you what, guys, you're going to be excited. So pay close attention to that. And uh, and we, we've done, in the past, what have we done, Jared? How much stuff have we given away? We've given away crazy amounts of stuff. What, what have we given away recently, Jared? Uh, we gave away the, the Caltech PMR30 was one of them. We gave away the Chris Vector. Uh, what else did we give away? Oh, the Diamondback pistols? We gave away six of those? Yeah, six of those. We we definitely take care of everybody that pays attention. Yeah, we gave away uh, uh, six Diamondback pistols at the beginning of Season 3. Uh we gave what we had a, the grand prize for season three was the Chris Vector carbine. We had the whole package deal. We had a PMR 30 that we gave away at uh, Christmas time. Oh, and we did the, uh, the, the Kiapa, the M422, uh, combo. We did that, uh, at the, it was our Ides of March, uh, giveaway. So we, we give away guns. Oh, one of another one of our, uh, Partners, we gave away holsters. We've given away holsters and accessories, and and of course, if you are, you know, if you're a uh, a student of the gun and you post your question, you might have your question picked, and it might be used for the student of the week contest. And we also now don't forget about our good friends over there at Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. You want to check out Crossbreed Holsters at CrossbreedHolsters.com. It's really simple, and it's going to be the if you pick one up. Get your order in. It's going to be the most comfortable in the waistband holster that you've ever worn. And, of course, we don't want to forget about our bandwidth sponsors, the Firearms Radio Network, the guys who brought us on and gave us the opportunity to come before you guys. Well, of course, we have a student of the week, and Jared's going to tell us who our student of the week is. Our student of the week is Richard Jensen, and he wants to know, in an emergency, should I give any thought to protecting my hearing? Should my ultimate goal be to have a suppressor attached to my home defense pistol or rifle? 
Richard, that is a good question, and it's actually something that's been dealt with uh, for many, many years. The first person that I ever read or an article I ever read by a person was uh, Masad Ayub, probably, oh, I'm thinking 20 years ago. Uh, he did an article about his home defense kit and how he didn't just have a pistol. He had a pistol with a light attached to it, and he also kept a a pair of the electronic hearing protection muffs next to the pistol on the nightstand or wherever he had stored the gun. And, you know, people kind of, you know, they're like, oh, what do you expect or, or whatever. It's like, well, what you expect is if you actually if you actually have to touch the trigger and press that thing, it's going to be really loud. And the last thing you want to do is deafen yourself in a home defense situation. Now, obviously, if it's a matter of stopping a bad person from harming your family or and, you know, damaging your ears, you're going to stop the bad person first and then deal with your hearing second. But in the United States of America, I believe right now it's 30, you see, 37 or 39 states. It is legal for a citizen. That's right. You guys out there, uh, if you live in free America, you can own a sound suppressor or silencer for a handgun or a rifle. And uh, guys who uh, poo-poo the idea of having a silencer really kind of miss the point. Uh, a silencer or a suppressor. Now, people are like, well, you know, it's not a silencer. Look, here's the deal. Some companies call their products silencers. Some companies call their products suppressors. In Europe, they call them moderators. And I'm not going to get into the argument over verbiage right now. So if you really are bunged up over the use of the word suppressor, um, you can write a letter to the various companies and try and convince them to change their verbiage. But whether it's suppressor or silencer or moderator, uh, a can on the front of your gun that makes it quieter uh, is a great idea. The fact is, is the noise that's produced by a firearm, the noise is just a byproduct. The noise doesn't make the cartridge fly faster. The noise doesn't make the, or I'm sorry, the bullet fly faster. It does not make the projectile hit harder. It does not add a greater amount of power to the firearm. It's just noise. That's it. Now, I know American men love noise. We like to make noise. We like to have loud trucks and loud motorcycles and loud music. But the fact is, when it comes to shooting, the noise is simply a byproduct of the cartridge igniting. That's it. It doesn't give you any added benefit. Uh, but what it does do is if you're in a home defense situation, now we've already talked about the fact that I strongly believe that the AR-15 or the various types of AR rifles or carbines, really it, it is the king of home defense. But the downside is it's loud. It's ridiculously ear splitting loud for, you know, people who poo poo the 223 cartridge or the 556 and they call it a, you know, they call it a souped up 22 Magnum or a varmint cartridge or whatever they call it. They disparage it for being as little as it is. It's a loud sucker. And if you fire that in a home, in a hallway, in a room, it's going to damage your ears. Now, is it going to make you deaf instantly? No, not necessarily. But what you're dealing with is that if you actually have to fire that gun, and when you are keeping a firearm at home for personal defense, we're, we don't use them as a magic talisman to scare away bad guys because we actually possess them. You need to understand and you need to approach it with the fact or the idea that, hey, I might actually have to press that trigger. I might need to make noise. And if I do so, what's going to happen? Now, I understand not everybody can, you know, uh, afford a suppressor or a silencer. Not everybody lives in a free America where you can own them. But uh, if you can't have a suppressor on your home defense gun, the next best thing is, act is ear protection. And we've talked about those before. We've talked about the electronic earmuffs and how they are good investment, especially if you're going to take training because that way you can just leave them on. You can hear your instructor's, you know, instructions, uh, but that protects you from the loud sounds. And it's really not a bad idea. And you're like, well, what, what are you expecting, Paul? I mean, how paranoid are you? Well, I'd rather be prepared. You know, some people call it paranoid. I'd rather be prepared. And you need to think, hey, what happens if I actually have to touch off around inside my house? So, uh, and if you're willing to take that extra effort, I think it is a good effort. I think it's a good thing for you to do. Uh, so if you can't own a uh, silencer or a suppressor, then the next best thing is to have some type of electronic hearing muffs.
Now, don't forget, it's the summertime. Now, 4-H shooting sports runs uh, all year long. I think they take a break off for, you know, Christmas and January time frame. But right now, in the summertime, is when the 4-H shooting sports, uh, that's when they're doing the majority of their outdoor activities, they're doing their range work, they're doing their camps, and so forth. And the 4-H shooting sports, if you are a dedicated gun person, if you are a shooter, if you are a hunter, if you are a person who believes uh, in our right to keep and bear arms, and you believe that the youth are our future, don't forget about them. Uh, we, we've been talking about them on the radio, but I want you guys out there to, to give serious consideration to how could I help the four day shooting sports program. And if you want to help out uh, someone very, very specifically, uh, the Ohio 4-H shooting education camp is coming up. It's going to be the uh, end of July, the third week of July, I believe it is. And Larry Harris is the Ohio shooting sports coordinator. And if you want to volunteer your time, if you want to make a donation to the camp, if you want to make a donation of 22 rimfire ammo, because they can really use it. Everybody knows that 22 is, it's like gold today. And if you have several thousand rounds that you're sitting on, you might want to, you know, consider donating a little bit of it to the 4-H shooting sports program. And I talked to Larry this week. Uh, we had a great conversation and he told me that the camp is almost maxed out already. Uh, I believe they're looking at having probably close to 200, if not 200 youth plus the uh, adult instructors there for the senior camp. And then the junior camp, uh, inc- they max it out at 75 kids I- each year for the junior camp. And then the senior camp may have up to 200 young people from all across, uh, not just Ohio, but are all the surrounding areas as well. And as, as we always do uh, after uh, the show's over, uh, after we record this, Jared will put it, uh, all the material up on the website. You can go to studentofthegunradio.com, and you can just click on the link. And if you want to help those guys out, you can. Now, we're going to do a little bit of a, a quick follow-up about last week's conversation on night sites or tritium sites. And uh, this week, we've had a lot of folks who have contacted us and said, hey, I didn't, you know, I never thought about that before. Or you really gave me something to think about. Well, one of the uh, one of our uh, friends wrote in and they said, well, the big dot sites, the excess big dot sites, I, I know they're good for close up work, but what if I have to take a shot beyond 10, 15, 20 yards? Or is it, is it so big that it obscures the target? Well, <laughs> uh, un- unless you're shooting at, you know, like field rats or something, it- it's not going to obscure the target. If, if your, your target is a homo sapien, uh, a, a person, it- it's not going to obscure your target. But uh, when it comes to aiming, like precision aiming, one thing that people, they kind of, they miss the boat on or they really don't understand with the big dot, if something is close, let's say five, six, seven yards, three yards, you punch the gun, you know, press the gun out, find that big white dot, put it in the center of your target, press the trigger. Well, what if I need to take a precision shot? What if, and, and it's farther away? No sweat. They got you covered. What you do is you just use the top edge of the big dot, you know, the, the top edge of the dot, and you use that as your aiming point. You use that as your reference point. So if you need to shoot, let's say you're really feeling froggy and the, I don't know, it, it's bad guy's 35 yards away uh, or 40 yards or whatever, uh, you use the top edge of the, uh, of the dot there as your reference point for accurate uh, shooting. Now, James Yeager of Tactical Response has done a, he actually did a, an accuracy, a big dot accuracy video, and it's been all over the internet for several years now. But he shoots uh, steel pepper popper targets at 25, 50, 75, and 100 yards with a Glock 19 equipped with excess big dot sights. And he's able to hit a pepper popper at 100 yards with them. So I, I really doubt that you guys will ever have, I hope that you'll never have to shoot at a person who's 100 yards away with a handgun. But uh, I just wanted to come back and touch on that real quick uh, during this week's episode. Now, the next story, you may or may not have seen it where you live. What we find in the United States is the news media cannot wait for us, the American gun owner. And whether we like it or not, the news media and the people who don't want us to own guns, they take all gun owners and they lump us together together. In a big group. 
And you say, well, how can I be held responsible for the actions of a guy who owns a shotgun in in Provo, Utah, or Maine, or Illinois? How can I be responsible for that? Well, technically you're not. But the fact is, is the big news media cannot wait for a gun owner to make a mistake so they can put it all over the news. Things that, that should be... You know, either nobody's business or nobody's concern, other than those who live in the surrounding area, get put out, picked up by the national news wires and distributed all over the place. And case in point, we've got our story here out of Illinois. Apparently, it's just uh, a Chicago suburb. And <clears throat> the title reads, 10 injured when gun accidentally fires in St. Charles Club. You guys heard it right. A gun accidentally fired and injured 10 people. Now, when you read that headline, what do you get out of that? Or what are they trying to imply? That there's there was this super gun and it was over in the corner. It was in, you know, someone had set it in the corner. And all of a sudden, the gun decided, now's a good time to fire. And the gu- or the gun accidentally fired itself. The gun was behaving up to that point in time, but then all of a sudden, it, it the gun lost its mind, and it accidentally fired, and it injured 10 people. Holy cow, what kind of a super gun is that? And you're like, aha, Joe Biden was right. A shotgun can can take out you know battalions. One shot from a shotgun can take out an entire enemy battalion. Okay, well... As intelligent people, we have to dive just a little bit deeper into the story to come up with, uh, you know, more that your low information voters. I stole that from Rush, but uh, your low information voters will read that and they'll say, see, guns are dangerous. Well, yeah, so are motorcycles. So are chainsaws. So are power drills. So is bleach. Those things are all dangerous if they're mishandled. But I digress. Well, what exactly happened? What happened that this super gun was able to uh, shoot 10 people with one shot? Well, it turns out that a, this was at a uh, sportsman's club, the St. Charles Sportsman's Club in Illinois. And a gentleman apparently had been out on the range shooting trap or skeet or some shotgun sport. And he walked into the clubhouse where there was a bunch of other people. And the story says that he mistook a live cartridge of ammunition for a snap cap. He thought he was putting a snap cap uh, or a dummy piece of dummy ammunition in his gun. But what he actually did was he dropped in a live shell. (laughs) I believe, I believe the story says, oh yeah, it says the buckshot round. Uh, apparently when, when you write news stories for NBC, I, I think that every, these newspaper people or these uh, professional media people, every piece of shotgun ammunition is buckshot. <laughs> I, I kind of find it hard being having been around trap and skeet and sporting clays people. I kind of have a hard time believing that this guy had a pocket full of nine pellet buckshot instead of, you know, trap and skeet load. I think what he probably had was trap and skeet load. Uh, I don't think he fired a nine pill. I mean, I could be wrong, but the likelihood of that is is pretty uh, pretty slim. So uh, what did he do? Well, he thought he had dropped a snap cap into the breech of his shotgun, closes the action, puts his finger on the trigger, pulls the trigger. The gun was pointed down at the floor. Bam. Well, that makes for an interesting day. And uh, so 10 people were injured. And you're like, wow, he pointed it at the floor and 10 people were injured. Well, yeah, think about it. If you've ever been to a sportsman's club or something like that, what you generally have, what? You have a poured concrete floor and they put tile over it. It's pretty hard and it's pretty slick. And you point it and a shotgun, unlike a rifle, is a relatively a low velocity round. So instead of disintegrating, what happens when you shoot a shotgun? A lot of you uh, veterans out there, you know, if you shoot a handgun or a shotgun into something hard and smooth, like concrete, asphalt, a hard tile floor, what happens to that shot? Well, it hits the floor, it comes up about six inches and it starts and it ricochets in, in all directions. Now, 
Interestingly enough, high velocity rounds like 223, 308, and so forth, generally when they hit something hard like asphalt or concrete, they, they disintegrate into, into pieces. They don't hold, they don't stay together. A 223 round, when it hits concrete, is not going to stay together in one solid chunk and keep on going. It's going to break up and the fragments are going to go everywhere, but it's not going to ricochet. Uh, when I was in the police academy, what, 20 some years ago? Uh, that's one of the things that our firearms instructors demonstrated to us. They actually took a silhouette target and they laid it down on the uh, concrete sidewalks that were out there on the range. And they fired handguns and shotguns into the concrete. And we could see how they skipped off of the concrete, came up about six or seven inches and kept on going. And that's what happens when you shoot a shotgun into a hard floor. So we, uh, according to the story, and you're like, wow, that's horrible. Ten people are in the hospital. Mm, uh. No, it says... Three people were transported and seven people were treated at the scene and released. All right. Having been a, a first responder, policeman, a, uh, a medical trainer, here's what I can tell you when people are treated at the scene and released. What they did is they examined them, took tweezers, pulled out the little fragments, put bandages on them. I said, how do you feel? They're like, I feel Okay. All right, if you experience any problems in the future, go see your family doctor. Uh, it wasn't like there were, uh, you know, um, 10 pieces of buckshot through these people. Now, uh, three of them ha were taken to a local hospital to be treated. They probably had to actually go in and pull the shot out of their, you know, muscles or what have you. But And it also says that the shooter, who was age 69, was transported as well. Now, you might be thinking, you might be thinking that... Uh, well, am I going to, I'm not ragging on this guy. I'm not, I, I'm not here to throw stones, but what we need to do as gun owners is when there is a, when a gun goes bang and it wasn't supposed to go bang and people are injured, we're going to have two things. Number one, the media is going to jump all over us and they're going to say, see, this is why you shouldn't be allowed to have a gun. They'll tell you, who lives in Miami, Florida, that because a guy had a negligent discharge with a shotgun in Illinois, you can't be trusted to own one. Or in Los Angeles, or in Houston, Texas, or wherever you happen to live, they're going to say, see, see, this is why guns should be banned. Stop yourself. First of all, that's ridiculous. That'd be like every time there's a car crash, they come to you and say, see, this is why you shouldn't have a car. But we need to police ourselves. Now, first things first, let's dissect, or second thing second, let's dissect the title, Accidentally Fires. Ladies and gentlemen, if a gun, a gun guns are machines, okay, They're, they are machines made by the hands of men. They have springs and levers and all that good stuff. And uh, are machines fallible? Can machines break? Yes. Have there been instances where a sear spring or something has broken, released a hammer, and a gun fired because of a mechanical defect? Yes, there have been those instances. Now, they are very rare, but they have happened. In this case, it was not. An, an accident is simply something that uh, you could not have prevented by any reasonable means. You couldn't have known it was going to happen. It was legitimately an accident. When you put your finger on the trigger of a shotgun or rifle or a pistol and it goes bang because you press the trigger backwards, that's not an accident. That's not something that could have been prevented or could not have been prevented by any reasonable means. That is negligence. You're like, oh, you're mean. Dudes, it's time to suck it up and get tough. We can't keep calling when people put their fingers on triggers, press them, and the gun goes bang as it was designed to do. The gun performed exactly as it was built to perform. The gun is designed to go bang when you put a live cartridge in it and you press the trigger. That's what it's supposed to do. It's not supposed to divine your intent. The gun does not think. It cannot say, hmm, I don't think Johnny really wants to shoot me today, so I won't go off. No, that's not how it works. If you put your finger on the trigger and you press it and it goes bang and a round goes into something it wasn't supposed to go into, that's not an accident. It's negligence. Now, that doesn't make you a bad person, and that doesn't mean that we should go out and hang you from the nearest tree. What it does, though, is when, as it is a learning point, and what we need to do as a collective audience, and when something like this happens, we need to examine it and say, okay, is there something we could have done differently 
to make this not happen or or, or are we going to keep repeating it? And that's what we don't want to do. We don't want to just blindly drive on and keep making the same mistakes over and over again. What we want is when a situation like this happens, we want to examine it and say, all right, this happened. It was bad. We accept that. But what can we do? What steps can we take to ensure that something like this never happens again? Well, first and foremost, let's go back to the rules. Let's go back to the basic universal firearm safety rules. Now, uh, if you are a dedicated gun person, if you've been in the gun culture for a long time, you probably know who Colonel Jeff Cooper was. Colonel Jeff Cooper started the Gunsight Academy many moons ago back in the 70s, and he went out into the desert and he returned from the desert. And when he returned from the desert, he had a small tablet because it only had four things on it, and it had the universal firearms safety rules. Number one, all guns are always loaded. Now, these have been paraphrased, and they've been tweaked a little bit um, for the last 30, 40 years, but the, the meaning is the same. We treat all guns as if they are always loaded. If you treat every gun as if it is always loaded all the time, chances of you having a negligent discharge are very slim. All right, number two. Never let the muzzle cover anything which you are not willing to destroy. Think about it like this. If this gun in my hand were to go bang right now, would the projectile go into something that would bleed or not? It's a yes or no question. If this gun goes bang right at this moment in time, would anyone bleed? Uh, it, you know, It's essentially a yes or no question. And if the answer is yes, you have to ask yourself, then why am I pointing the gun at it? All right, number three, keep your finger off of the trigger until your sights are on the target. And this has also been elaborated, I've seen it, until your sights are on the target and you've made the decision to shoot the gun. Okay, so keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target and you made the decision to shoot. Now, the last one is know your target. That's the short version, but the long version is know your target, what's around it, and what's beyond it. And these are the universal safety rules. These aren't range rules. These aren't club rules. These are universal. By universal, it means that they apply everywhere in the known universe. They apply in your bedroom, in your car, out at the range, inside of the clubhouse. They apply everywhere. And every time you hear of a situation or read a story in the newspaper that says, accidental discharge or gun shoots accidentally and, and two people injured, one person injured, what have you. Uh, what you need to ask yourself is, all right, number one, was it an accident? Could it have been prevented or could it not have been prevented? Was it something that no one could have seen coming? It just We had no idea this was going to happen. The gun malfunctioned and it went bang. Okay. Or did someone, did a human being do something that could have been prevented? If they would have done something differently, could it have been prevented? And did they follow? And when you hear if a person is injured, if a person is negligently injured, a person who wasn't supposed to be shot ends up getting shot, what do we know? Well, that at least one, probably two, sometimes three of the universal safety rules were violated. Well, let's look at this particular instance. Okay, number one, treat all guns as if they're always loaded all the time. All right, we have a, uh, the guy goes into the clubhouse with his shotgun and he puts what he thinks is a snap cap into the breech and then he presses the trigger. Well, number one, if he would have treated the gun like it was loaded, would he have done that? Yes or no? You say, well, but Paul, he put a snap cap in it, so it makes it okay. Mm, no. In the training world, snap caps are used to support drills and practice regimen. They're not used. And I can, I'm going to take a quick left turn. I believe based upon what I read in this story that this individual put a snap cap in his shotgun and lowered the hammer onto it because he had been told or he believed that you should never store a gun with the hammers cocked. I'm sure it was probably an internal firing pin. Uh, because it will wear on the springs or the it, it will it will decrease the spring life on your firing pin springs. There's that myth going on, on out there. And I, I'm not going to spend the whole show talking about that, but I believe that's what he was doing. But what he was not doing was treating all guns as if they're always loaded. Now, number two, there's been a little bit of uh, – there's, there's been several – oh, 
op-eds or comments or what have, have you uh, after this story came out on the Internet. And people were like, well, see, he pointed in a safe direction. So he followed one of the rules. Okay, yes, he pointed it not at a human being, but at the floor. Okay, so he did that, and, and we'll, we'll give him that one. Number three, keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target and you made a decision to shoot. This is a big one. This is the big one. When, when people have negligent discharges, you don't have a negligent discharge because you pointed the gun at a person. You don't have a negligent discharge because you treated it like it wasn't loaded. You have a negligent discharge because your little digit went onto that curvy thing and pressed backwards. And that right there is the cause or the root cause of most every single negligent discharge unless, you know, a branch or a tree limb or a puppy's foot, you know, jumps on the trigger. The fact is people putting their fingers on the triggers when they shouldn't be there is the greatest cause of negligent discharges. You say, yeah, but but he knew that, well, no, ha, 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 ha. Why do we follow the rules? We don't follow the rules because things are always perfect. We put protocols in place to protect us from ourselves. We put protocols in place so that when we have a mental oops or we have a lapse in reasoning or you've been outside all day long in the sun and you're hot and you're dehydrated and you walk inside and you're not 100%, your mind is somewhere else. That's why we put these protocols in place. We don't put them in place when we're 100% sharp and we're on the ball. The safety protocols are put in place to protect us from ourselves, from our own human fallibility. Yes, human beings are fallible. We make mistakes, and there's no shame in that. But the reason that we put these rules in place is to keep you from making those mistakes, or if you do make a mistake, to minimize the damage from that mistake. Now, what's the fourth one? Know your target, what's around it, and what's beyond it. So let's, for the sake of argument, let's say that the floor was his legitimate target. Say, okay, I've decided that the floor is my target. I'm going to press the trigger into the floor. Now, when it comes to number four, it says know your target, what's around it, and what's beyond it. Well, what's around it and what's beyond it was a bunch of other people. And so, and you say, well, how could this have been minimized? Well, number one, if you believe legitimately, I'll throw you a bone, that you cannot store a shotgun with the firing pin cocked, with the with the the trigger pin, the spring from the pin in the in the cocked position, that it will damage it. You believe that? Okay, great. Put the snap caps in out there on the range. When you're in the on the range and you've decided, all right, I'm all done shooting. I'm going to put this gun away. Go ahead and drop your snap caps in there and snap them in the direction of the down range. If you're on the skeet range and you mistake a, a, a snap cap for a live round and you point it down range and press it and it goes bang, no harm, no foul, right? Why are you doing that inside of a clubhouse? And I'm not going to get into their business, but is this common practice? Is this something that people normally do? Do they walk in, uh, you know, with guns and, and, you know, fiddle fart around with them? Handling guns in administrative fashions, in a non-shooting fashion, this is when guns go bang, when they're not supposed to. The more you handle a firearm in a non-shooting fashion, you're like, what do you mean? Well, no, do you ever have negligent discharges when you're at the, when you're on the range, you're at the firing point, your target is in front of you and you've decided you want to shoot? Is that when you have an accidental or a negligent discharge? No. <laughs> How many people have negligent discharges when they're standing on the range and their targets down in front of them? That's not when people have negligent discharges. Not to say that it could happen. When do people have negligent discharges? When they're not on the range, when they're in their bedrooms, when they're in the clubhouse, when they're standing next to the car, when they're out in the parking lot. That when you're handling the gun in a non in the in the, or the police and the military world, a non tactical fashion. Uh, when it's you're handling it in administrative fashion, so I, I'm not here to throw cast stones at this gentleman. I really am not. 
But the worst thing that we could do as responsible American gun owners is to read this story and say, huh, well, stuff happens, no big deal, let's just drive on with our life. No, that's not what we want to do. We want to examine this, and we want to make a purposeful decision from this point forward, say, hey, okay, that was a mistake, that happened, it shouldn't have happened, but what can I do to make sure that that doesn't happen to me? Or what can I do to make sure that that doesn't happen in my at my club or my range or in my house and unfortunately there the four universal safety rules uh are not always applied they're very simple i mean if you have a even a smattering of the you know comprehension of the english language a basic comprehension of the english language you should be able to apply those four rules but what do men and I'm going to, I'm going to harp on men. Men, uh, don't uh, follow rules that either they don't agree with or that interferes with what they want to do. You're like, well, what do you mean, Paul? That's, that's bull crap. No, think about it like this. You say, well, I, I want to balance the muzzle of my shotgun on my, on my foot. Uh, when I'm not shooting, when I'm, when I, when it's not my turn to shoot, I'm just going to turn the gun upside down. And I'm going to put it on my foot and I'm going to rest it. Well, what is, what is rule number two? Never let the muzzle cover anything you're not willing to destroy. Or do you want to destroy your foot? Oh, no, it's no big deal because the gun's empty. The gun's empty until the gun's not empty. Well, why don't we follow that rule? Well, we don't follow that rule because it interferes with what we want to do. And because we want to base the gun, you know, put the shotgun muzzle on our toe and rest on the gun like it's a cane, then we just decide not to follow that rule. If you are at a club where they ignore the four universal safety rules or they only follow the ones that they feel like, you might want to ask yourself, why is that? Why is it that I'm in a club where they, I mean, how many, how many of you guys out there, guys and gals, have gone to a public range or a club or a members club and the rules are, how, how many rules are there? There's dozens. The last club that I belonged to, they had a big sign with all the range rules on the range, it started at the ceiling and it went all the way to the floor. I think there were 37 range rules. I'm not kidding. And, and I thought to myself, well, if you follow the basic four, if everyone out there, if every gun owner, if every shooter, if every person on the range followed the basic four, you would not have to worry about any negligent discharges, about bullets going where they're not supposed to go. Uh, the more rules, and you know, my personal opinion is, the more rules you add to the list, the less likely it is that anyone is going to read and follow all those rules. I mean, literally, thirty-seven rules. Why don't, you, you're going to screw up? You might as well just not even show up on the range because eventually you're going to violate something or multiple of them. So, uh, if you follow the four basic universal safety rules, you should be good to go. Well, this uh, next story is a little bit of a see, I told you so, or, hey, Bloomberg, how's that gun control working out for you? You may have seen this story, and this was all over the news, much to the dismay of uh, New York. It says, mayhem in the city, 25 people shot in 48 hours. And uh, this, the uh, story I've got before me is from the New York Daily News. It's a uh, timeline, dateline, June 2nd, 2013. Essentially, it says that uh, yeah, 25 people were shot in, over a period of 40, 48 hours in the city of New York. Now, you might be asking yourself, if you're a, a smart person, you're like, well, how can that be? Doesn't the city of New York and now the state of New York have some of the strictest gun control laws in the nation? I mean, aren't they competing with Chicago for the strictest gun control laws in the, in the nation? Well, yeah, they are. And it looks like they're also competing with Chicago for most violent city in the nation as well. Now, rational people, adults, you guys out there who are listening to the sound of my voice, what do we know? Well, what we know is that people who want to take our guns away, people who think that you shouldn't be allowed to have one, 
they believe that it's the actual physical object. Well, they don't believe that. They're disingenuous. They want you to be disarmed. That's what it is. But the story that they tell is that guns are too dangerous to be allowed in the hands of mere peasants like you people right there. But, uh, yeah, uh, essentially it was uh, 48 hours worth of gangbanger retribution. Uh, New York gangbangers, drug dealers, bad people shooting up each other, shooting up their neighborhoods. And uh, we, as God-fearing citizens who own firearms, go to work every day, pay our taxes, raise our children, they look out at us across America and say, see, this, th- what this, ha- what happened in New York, that's why you people shouldn't be allowed to have guns. That's why you don't need to have them. I've got an answer for you. How about the answer is not to surrender our freedom or to have the law abiding give up their freedom. How about we hold human beings responsible for their behavior? What? Hold the actual human beings responsible for their behavior? How, how do we do that? You mean we'd actually have to gut check and arrest people and put them in jail and, oh, keep them there? Make them actually stay in jail? Oh, you're, you're, you're a bad person, Paul. You're a racist. You just, you just want to put people in jail. Yeah, I want to put criminals in jail and I want them to stay there. Uh, as a police officer, former police officer, I can tell you this, ladies and gentlemen and people of America. Only a small percentage of the overall population are criminals. But here's the deal. Criminals are what they call recidivists. We have recidivist criminals, people that do it over and over and over again. And we have lost the capacity or the will to deal with them and to actually punish them. Because someone sold us a bill of goods that, well, you just, you can't punish people for their behavior. That doesn't, that doesn't solve anything. Yeah, it does. It keeps them off the street from shooting it up like a shooting gallery. How about we put these people in jail and keep them there? How about we punish them? How about we make jails places that you don't ever want to go back to? No cable TV, no free college education, no air conditioning. If you go to jail, you're there to be punished, not to be pampered. And that's what we do with our prisons today. Our prisoners, people that are in prisons today, have more rights than you do. They have greater rights to privacy than you do. You don't believe me? Read the news. Uh, so, yeah, in uh, blue, my... Uh, <laughs> My title for this one is, How's That Gun Control Working Out For You? And they're such lunatics. Bloomberg and his ilk are so crazy that they'll actually tell you that the mayhem in New York City, that that actually affirms their argument that you have too much freedom. Because you know what Bloomberg's been telling us for years is, well, it's not the fault of the criminals in New York. It's all these people that surround New York, all you citizens that have so much gun freedom and easy access to guns. That's why criminals in New York have guns, because the citizens of the state of Virginia are able to purchase them. So keep that in mind the next time you're talking to one of your uh, your liberal coworkers. Now, the next one, this one, this is kind of a follow-up from a previous uh, episode of Student of the Gun Radio. We talked about when Colorado decided to criminalize gun ownership in their state. And the lead cheerleader for criminalizing gun owners in Colorado was John Senate President, State Senate President John Morse. This is the guy who told his fellow senators who advised them not to listen to the people to ignore the constituents because they didn't know what they're talking about. He knew that they were getting a lot of heat from their constituents telling them that they didn't approve of this legislation. But it was just such an important thing to do that they needed to go ahead and ignore the citizens and do what needed to be done. Well, guess what, John Morse? The citizens of the state of Colorado organized themselves and they followed the letter of the law, which apparently you only follow when it's convenient for you. And they put together a recall effort. Yes, in most states in the United States of America, there is a legal redress if you have a politician who turns out to be crooked or fails to follow the will of the people. It's not easy and it's not meant to be easy. It's meant to, you know, be a punishment for someone who has really gone off the reservation. And uh, what you know, John Morris is way off the reservation. 
to use a little Western lingo there. But uh, what they, they needed to gather 7,200 signatures from registered voters in Morse's district to recall him. Now, when they recall him, that means when someone is recalled, let's say a, an ambassador is recalled, that means they're fired. It means they have to come home, they have to go home, and, and they're no longer allowed to be there. Well, they needed 7,200. What they gathered was 16,000, more than double the number. And when uh, confronted with this, Mr. Morse uh, basically said that he doesn't care and he's not going anywhere. He stated that he had, uh, as of the dateline of this story, which was, let me see, dateline June 3rd or 4th. Uh, I believe it was June 3rd. But uh, yeah, he said uh, he has no intention of resigning and he does not plan to leave there and he's going to fight this. Well, <laughs> that people in Colorado, a congratulations, good on you for getting together. And, and this was, you know, this was not a, this wasn't uh, an organized political thing. This was grassroots. This was people who were mad and say, and hey, you have to listen to the constituents. You're a civil servant. You're not a king. You're not a duke. You're not a lord. You don't just get to decide what you want to do. You're supposed to be there representing the people. Remember that whole representative republic thing? What? You mean these people are supposed to go and vote like the constituents want them to vote? What? Oh, it's Paul, it's it's not 1800 anymore. That's not what we do. We go to Congress and we do what we want to do. And uh, that's exactly what uh, Mr. Morris has done. As he went to Congress, he went to the Colorado State Senate and he's like basically uh he pulled an Eric Cartman and said, "Whatever, I do what I want." Well, the people of Colorado said, "Whatever, you're gone." But uh there's as of as of right now as we record this, they have to verify and validate all of the signatures. But keep a sharp eye out on this story because I, I believe that uh, the people that organized it, they weren't slouches. They weren't acorn uh, getting people to vote six times. Uh, <laughs> when they come up and they say, yeah, we verified that out of 16,000, that 14,507 are valid registered voters. Let's see whether Mr. Morse whether he resigns or whether he ignores the will of the people. And if he does ignore the will of the people, what happens then? Do we send the sheriff in? Do we send the uh, district attorney in? Do we send in the uh, the Colorado State District Attorney? Um, I don't know. But keep a close eye out on that. And, we're, of course, as always, we're going to put the links up on Student of the Gun Radio so you guys can look at these stories. So keep an eye on that. And, hey, for you guys out there in uh, occupied Colorado, um, congratulations. Now, don't forget, everybody out there in the listening audience, we could not put together and bring you Student of the Gun Radio if we did not have the support of our fantastic sponsors. And we always want to take a moment to thank them because not only do they make good stuff and not only do they sponsor us, but they're our friends. They're, they're the people who sponsor Student of the Gun are legitimately our friends are people that when we're at trade shows that we sit down with and have coffee or, you know, share a beer or what have you. They're genuine good Americans. So make sure that you thank Caltech Weapons of Cocoa, Florida, and of course, Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. Check them out at crossbreedholsters.com. And our buddies over at the Firearms Radio Network. Don't forget, there's a lot of shows on the Firearms Radio Network, including ours, so you can check those out. And until next time, remember, you're a beginner once, but you are a student for life. 